This is the food chain of the wolf population in Yellowstone National Park. Maintaining this food chain is essential in protecting the livelihood of each of these animals and the entire ecosystem they live in. The consequence of such disruption was exactly what happened before 1995 where the wolves were no longer roaming in the mountains and valleys due to relentless hunting. In their absence, the elk population exploded, leading to overgrazing of vegetation in the valleys and gorges, as they no longer had a predator to fear. With the return of wolves, the elk population is now under control, allowing the flora to thrive once more. But it didn't just stop there. The effects were far-reaching. The recovering vegetation stabilized the riverbanks, reducing erosion. Rivers meandered less, channels deepened, and small pools formed. The ripple effects of the food chain are truly remarkable. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with the famine in China? Well, something similar occurred in 1959 during Mao Zedong's leadership. What ensued was unlike anyone has ever seen. The devastation was so bad that the number of people who died is comparable to the numbers of people who died in the Second World War. What's even more baffling is how it happened. Mao made several ill-advised decisions and one of them was to launch a campaign to eradicate sparrows. This seemingly harmless campaign had devastating consequences, disrupting the delicate balance of the ecosystem. The extent of the devastation was so unimaginably severe that any writings of the incident are still banned in China to this day. To fully conceptualize the sheer scale of the catastrophe and how Mao came up with the idea of eliminating sparrows, let's quickly go through a brief rundown of China's history. In the first half of the 20th century, four out of five of the people worked on the land in desperate poverty. Most were in debt to landowners or moneylenders. Even when industrialization dawned on China, what ended up happening was it only widened the gap between the rich and the poor. Out of desperation, the people fought for their lives to demand their rights. The Communist Party emerged from the struggle, but it wasn't an easy feat because, at the beginning, they lost. They were either publicly executed or exiled where they had to find a living someplace else. Their victory only came after World War II when a fierce civil war broke out between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party. After four years of struggle, the Communist Party successfully drove the Nationalists to Taiwan. The greed of the Nationalist Party was even present at the end of its lifeline as they brought along all of the nation's wealth with it, leaving China in bankruptcy. With no other choice but to lead the poor country from the ground up, Mao promised that the new China he envisioned will be able to stand on its own feet alongside with other great nations in the world. Immediate and drastic change swept through China as the ruling class and landlords found themselves below the peasants in social standing. Each and every one of the peasants had their moment to lash out at them demanding them to return back their lands. Landowners were seen as enemies of the state as they were the ones who made their life miserable, and thus hundreds and thousands of them were executed. In return, the peasants were handed in their lands and for the first time in their lives, they experienced justice. Mao has not only won the war, but also his people's trust. For a few years, life in China improved, despite minimal economic progress. In exchange, the freedom they longed for was finally in their hands. That is, until Mao's extreme beliefs were implemented. Mao introduced a radically new campaign called The Great Leap Forward, utilizing propaganda films to inspire participation and employing party activists to ensure compliance. Mao aimed to rapidly propel China to economic heights comparable to other major nations within a remarkably short period. 
Mao was so confident in his vision that he scrapped his initial timeline of 15 years and cut it down to 2 years. To combat disease and protect their hard-earned food, Mao initiated the Four Pass Campaign, calling on citizens to eradicate mosquitoes, rats, flies, and sparrows. You might have noticed something odd about that list, because sparrows don't really fit in, do they? They're actually pretty helpful because they eat insects that can ruin crops. But Mao thought sparrows were eating too much of their harvest, so he included them in the campaign. Fueled by blind trust in their leader, people mercilessly drove sparrows to exhaustion using rocks, slingshots, and loud noises until they all fell from the sky. And those who killed the most were praised and rewarded. With the sparrow population eradicated, the people faced a looming catastrophe. It was only a matter of time before they began to feel its devastating effects. The changes were so drastic that the very institution of a family was abolished, including the roles of mothers and housewives. This was done to maximize the workforce as well as the country's production. The focus shifted to the production of grain and iron. Child rearing became a shared responsibility, and communal eating at large canteens such as the communal hall became the norm. And like the aim of the campaign, which is all about production, the productivity of each individual became their currency. The more they worked, the more they earned in work tokens, which were used to exchange for food in the canteen. To manage the vast population, people were organized into communes, each supervised by an appointed district leader. Private land ownership was prohibited and the government was involved in the agricultural economy. Regional party leaders were tasked with setting production quotas for the communes under their control. And this is where the mistakes in farming techniques became evident. The implementation of close planting, influenced by Soviet agronomists, was particularly problematic. Lysenko was known for rejecting widely accepted methods in favor of his own. The close planting method involved initially tripling the density of seedlings, followed by doubling it again. The theory was that plants of the same species would not compete with each other. However, in reality, they did compete, leading to stunted growth of the plants. Now, with rivalries being encouraged where each commune pledged impossible figures for their produce, at the time of the harvest, they were more than devastated to find that they couldn't keep up with their unrealistic goals. Not to mention how much they are going to starve in the canteen because they didn't meet their goals in the first place. Because of this, they had to lie to their leaders, purporting idealistic figures and, as proof, they replanted already harvested plants into the field. And just like a domino effect, the peasants lied in order to survive. Their leaders are then fed with false data, which distracted them from prioritizing food production. So now, many of the workforce were moved to producing iron, and in turn, the higher-ups would export the excess amount of grains to the cities, essentially starving themselves without realizing. The final factor contributing to the famine was Mao's vision to double steel production in a single year. Instead of relying solely on heavy industry, small furnaces were built in backyard across the country. People gave away their possessions to be melted down as scrap metal. While this initiative was exciting, the steel produced was often impure and brittle, making it useless even for basic tools. This diversion of resources and effort away from food production exacerbated the famine. Despite the countless hours and the efforts of millions of people working tirelessly to increase production, their work was all in vain. The county party committee handled its first desecration case in spring of 1959, when police detained a vagrant cooking the flesh of a dead child. The county public security bureau had no idea how to handle the case, but finally designated it as desecration of human remains and formally arrested the perpetrator. The committee's secretary of politics and law determined that the individual, though criminal, was 
emaciated and lacked political motives. As a result, he was given two steamed buns, a lecture, and then released. Those who consumed human flesh often suffered from severe diarrhea and died. One harrowing account comes from a survivor in a village where a family of four was reduced to just a mother and her emaciated daughter. Driven to madness by starvation, the mother killed her daughter and cooked her flesh to eat. The trauma left her completely deranged, repeatedly crying out her daughter's name. It's ironic how because of the communist's meticulous record-keeping habit, it became easy to learn the extent of the Great Famine as archives from the communist era were starting to become declassified in 2003. One particularly gruesome report was from a local cadre in a country in Sichuan province, where he found out that a quarter of a million kilos of mud had been dug up and eaten. When he visited the village, he saw villagers naked and sweating under the glaring sun. With their shriveled bodies, they queued up to grab handfuls of white porcelain-colored mud from the pit to ease their starvation. There's a reason why we are not allowed to eat mud, because it's lethal. Once the moisture is absorbed into our body, the mud would harden like concrete. Then, the digestion system will be blocked and we would die in excruciating pain. And this was exactly what happened to these people. While a precise count of the victims will never be possible, Western analysis of official Chinese census figures subsequently indicated that as many as 30 million Chinese perished from excess mortality between 1959 and 1961. Even today, the sheer magnitude of that catastrophe seems almost incomprehensible. It would be as if the entire population of California had been swept off the face of the earth. Only in the following year, when news of the famine finally reached higher authorities through a letter, Liu Shaoqi, the president of the People's Republic of China, decided to investigate on his own. He went to his home village of Hunan to assess the extent of the famine. The devastation he witnessed was beyond comprehension, and many of his friends and relatives had died because of it. When Liu confronted local cadres about the famine, they hid the truth, repeating the same lies. They prioritized protecting their reputation over saving lives. Mao Tu, who was aware of the suffering, chose not to intervene. In a secret report from a meeting in Shanghai, it was revealed that Mao's strategy was to sacrifice rural people to feed those in the cities all along. There was a stark contrast between the lives of the powerful and the peasants. While the higher ups party, dine, and were entertained, the rural population was dying. The illusion of abundance was shattered for Lu. He realized he had to address the failures of the Great Leap Forward before it was too late. In January and February of 1962, Lu had the opportunity to halt Mao's disastrous Great Leap Forward during the 7,000 Cadres Conference in Beijing, attended by more than 7,000 CCP officials nationwide. The failure of the Great Leap Forward and the ensuing famine forced Mao to step back from active decision-making within the CCP and the central government. Responsibilities were shifted to Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, who initiated a series of economic reforms to reverse the radical changes of the Great Leap Forward. Communes were dissolved, land was returned to the farmers, and they were permitted to sell their produce in a free market. These reforms helped quickly resolve the famine. However, Mao was not ready to back down from his position of power that easily. He feared that reversing the Great Leap Forward's policies would lead to the return of a capitalist society. <laughs> Cap 
capitalizing on his skill in mobilizing the populace, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution, demonstrating his political strength by leading a mass swim across the Yangtze River at the age of 72. Just as he learned to mobilize his people during the Civil War, he masterfully spread his communist propaganda once more. He instilled his message in the form of entertainment. In schools, children were taught to chant his ideology in unison every single day. And he encouraged the young people to rebel against the authority. The proof of Mao's mastery in mobilizing his people can be seen when the rallies were carried out in Tiananmen Square in 1966. Mao took advantage of his people's radicalized views and went after his rivals. Liu Xiaoqi was accused of treason, arrested, beaten, and denied medical treatment for diabetes and pneumonia, ultimately succumbing to his illnesses in 1969. Deng Xiaoping was branded as capitalist roader and purged twice. Mao's authority became unassailable. And even today, more than half a century later, some deny Mao's role in the famine, or whether or not it even occurred in the first place.